Okay, the first method I want to discuss is word scores. Word scores is developed at the beginning of this century uh, by two professors at Trinity College Dublin, Michael Laver and Ken Benoit. Um, and the basic idea really is relatively straightforward. Um, we, might have, we might want to identify an ideological dimension on which we can set a number of documents. I will give you two examples in a minute. Um, but for example, you might want to take party manifestos that was certainly the application the authors had in mind when they developed the procedure. We might know of a very right-wing text and a very left-wing text. We can look at um, to what extent the words used in those texts correspond with their, are unique to either the left-wing or the right-wing document are more shared. Um, and then we can score all the other texts. So they always talk about two reference texts and the number of virgin texts. In machine learning, we would really talk about training that data and test data, um, but the idea is the same. So if we have two documents, one is very left-wing and one is very right-wing, and we can see that certain words are really only used by the left-wing te text or very often by the left-wing text and very rarely by the right-wing text, then we can give these words a very high left-wing score. If we have other words that are really used a lot in the right-wing text but not in the left-wing text, then we can give it a high right-wing score. And if there's words that neither text uses a lot or both text use a lot, we give it an intermediate score. So every word that is used in these two texts, the, the most left-wing and the most right-wing text, will get a score uh, based on how unique or how much shared it is between the two texts. And then we can get the whole set of virgin texts um, and we take all the words from the virgin text and then we can simply calculate for every word in the virgin text, in the test data, um, uh, for every word that is also used in one of the reference texts, it has to be, otherwise we do not have a score. We can assign a score based on that calculation, and then we can simply calculate some kind of average based on the frequency. So if there is a word in the virgin text, if there's a lot of words similar to the left-wing text, and very few words similar to the right-wing text, then it will get a relatively a high average score for a left wing uh, being left wing. And if it has a lot of text in common with the right wing text and very little with the left wing text, and vice versa, and then if it has shares a lot with both texts or with neither, then um, it will get an intermediate score. So we will be able to score and assign every test, text that we add, every document that we add, somewhere on this line from either being very much like the, like the left wing or very much like the right wing. Um, now, of course, this is very sensitive to the selection of reference text. You take a slightly different reference text and you get very different results. Um, you will also not be able to find any dimensions that you did not anticipate because it depends on the reference text. Um, and it can be quite heavily influenced by some terms that are actually not really capturing ideology, but it captures something else about this text, right? Um, so it's not... Um, uh, it, it might suffer a little bit compared to some of the other methods, um, but it is a very nice example of how text analysis started in political science. And, and it's much more directly aimed at this sort of identifying an ideology, uh, which was main, the main applications, as opposed to other kinds of underlying dimensions where we don't know what they really mean. So with factor analysis and principal component analysis, we find some underlying dimensions, but it is really a sort of post hoc interpretation an interpretation afterwards, what we think those dimensions might mean. Um, whereas here we have reference texts that we have a clear reason why we select them, because we think they are uh, really good examples of the extreme ends of the ideological skill, and then we can place all the other documents. So here's an example. This is basically the example with which they introduced the methods. They use the um, Irish uh, Parliament. So this is, what is this? Speaker debates, I think. Yeah, um, so they looked at speeches by uh, members of parliament, by TDs, and they looked at, tried to sort of scale them on a sort of basis of a very left-wing and a very right-wing document. Um, I have to admit, I forget which documents they used. So um, you can see the Fianna Fáil and uh, progressive Democrats ministers where they are placed, the Fianna Fáil party in general, you can see where the Independents and the Greens are, the Workers' Party, Fine Gael, and the Labour Party. And you can see that Labour Party would be most to the left, have a more negative score. Fianna Fáil would be more to the right. Um, 
and the greens are here somewhere in the middle, etc. Um, so this gives a reasonable sense of um, where these parties were located. And what you really see is that it's a more pro and anti-government uh, dimension. Right? So Fine Gael was in government at the time with the PDs, and Fine Gael and Labour were the main opposition. So probably more than ideological dimension, here we have more of a pro and anti-government dimension. We find that often in dimensional analysis, um, especially also in Ireland. And a year later, they published a similar um, analysis, but they really wanted to look at uh, movement. And actually, they compared an expert survey with the word score scores, uh, and then looked at uh, movement. This is, of course, a little bit tricky because they are very different methods of analysis of data collection. So I would, I would take this with a grain of salt. Um, but you can see how parties moved over time in terms of social policy and economic policy uh, based on these different dimensions. Uh, you might want to look up these articles if you're interested in uh, Irish politics and ideological position and, and see what you think. You now have an idea of how these methods work. Um, my favorite application in this field is um, by Boturo and uh, Mikhailov. So here they looked actually at Russian politics as opposed to Irish politics. Um, and they are not so much looking at an ideological position here. They are really looking at how in an authoritarian regime or semi-authoritarian regime, um, different local politicians interact with the national elite. So you might recall that in 2008, um, there was a strange situation in Russian politics. Uh, Putin had reached the end of his two-term limit. Um, he had to, according to the constitution, resign from his presidency. Um, but he, of course, wanted to stay in power. Um, and what he did is he identified his closest lieutenant, his closest um, supporter, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, um, and had him stand for the candidacy for the presidency. So Medvedev became, prime minister, uh, uh, became president. And then Medvedev appointed Putin prime minister. And really most of the staff from the Kremlin that was always working for Putin simply moved to the prime ministerial office. So really nothing much changed. But the question then is how much did it change? And, and there was a lot of debate then also among experts and, and uh, Russia watches at the time, like who was really in charge? One was constitutionally in charge. Um, Medvedev was the president and nominally in charge. Um, the other was um, considered to be de facto in charge. Uh, Putin was a very powerful position, a very powerful leader, he still is. So there was a lot of debate, a lot of lack of clarity as to um, who would really be in charge. Um, and so one way to maybe analyze this, and this is what the, um, these two authors did, is to look at how uh, local governors, who we can assume know a bit more about what is going on in the, in the hierarchy than, than we might as observers, try to see where they uh, position themselves. So um, they also take the word scores um, and they take the one dimension and they need the reference text and the virgin text. And the reference texts here are the two speeches, one by Medvedev and one by Putin, um, which is the State of the Union speech by uh, the president. And there's a similar State of the Union type speech by the prime minister. And, and these are done every year. So every year, both Putin and Medvedev will set out their plans and their strategies, etc., cetera, uh, during the speech. And so we have two reference texts. And then we take the speeches by all the local governors. There are 89 uh, regions in Russia, so there's quite a lot of data. And each of those will have a state of the state speech. So in their own province or region, um, or republic, etc., they will have their, their local um, annual speech. And they, so we can look in the year after Putin and Medvedev had their speeches, whether they try to pay lip service to Putin or they try to pay lip service to Medvedev. So the assumption is that this is an assessment of who is more influential. If you think Putin is really in charge, you want to speak a little bit like Putin. You want to be pleasing Putin uh, as a local governor um, to secure your own career. If you are, uh, think that Medvedev is really more in charge, you want to pay lip service to Medvedev's uh, point of view in the hope that that will guarantee your future career. So what did they do? So each of those dots is a speech by the governor. And at the top, you will be, so the higher score means being more similar to Putin. The lower score means being more similar to Medvedev. 
Um, and you can see that for the first two years, people were really not that sure. The governors were hedging their bets. Governors were speaking a bit like Medvedev, a bit like Putin. They took bits and pieces from both. But as the next elections in 2012 became nearer, and they started to get suspicions that Putin might uh, stand for candidacy again, that Putin is the one really in charge, that who they really need to support to su uh, su uh, sustain their career is Putin, they start to talk more and more like Putin. The points go up. So this is really a, quite a neat example of a word scores. We have two reference texts. Um, in this case, the State of the Union speeches by the President and the Prime Minister. And we have a lot of virgin texts. In this case, all the annual speeches by governors. And we see who in the year after the Putin and Medvedev speech start to talk more like Putin or more like Medvedev. And we can use this on average as a measure of relative perceived influence. In other words, um, as, as time goes on, really these um, governors start to think more and more that Putin is the one really in charge.